Hello and welcome back to the Families Embracing Diversity Conference. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Today, we're right now we're talking with Sonia Smith-King, who is um, going to talk to us about talking with kids about race and cultural diversity. Hi, Sonia. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing well. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I am Sonia Smith-King. Uh, honored to be here. I am uh, calling in from uh, Los Angeles, uh, so I'd like to recognize that I am on Gabrielino Tongva land, um, and also um, uh, just very thankful in this moment to be here. I am a founder of Mixed Up Clothing, a children's wear uh, clothing company designed through a multicultural lens. Um, and also Vice President of Multiracial Americans of Southern California, uh, which has been around for over 35 year years. Uh, we do advocacy, education, um, uh, and you know, community events around multicultural, multiracial, and the transracially adopted communities. That is amazing and very necessary. Um, so. This is a big topic that we are about to dive into, and I'm very excited to be talking with it through you with all of your expertise and experience. But why is it important for parents to talk with their children about race and cultural diversity? Yeah, this is so important. Uh, I myself identify as African-American and um, uh, Mexican. Uh, I'm a military brat, so I was born in Puerto Rico. And then my family moved and was stationed on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Um, and today, like I said, I'm here in Los Angeles where I'm married to my husband who is Korean American. Um, and we are raising four multilingual, multicultural, multiracial uh, children. And so this topic is really near and dear to my heart. It's something I've been talking about uh, for decades. Um, and it's important because I think now more than ever, as, as I've kind of seen my children grow, uh, I have adults down to teenagers, um, they're just exposed more in society than uh, ever before. And they just have so much more access. So I think it's so important to talk about race and cultural diversity just because the world has changed and, um, and is changing. And so it's, it's important to learn about racial differences and to talk about biases from an early age and to, you know, because we are primarily their first teachers. So it's important to deal um, with them and, and teach them about the differences because research shows that as early as like six months, a baby's brain can notice these race-based kind of differences. Um, and be by about age two to four, they can internalize some racial bias. And probably about adolescence, around that age 12, uh, children start to become a little bit more set in their beliefs. And so it's important for us as parents, um, as, uh, as adults, to kind of talk about those, uh, about culture, diversity, heritage, and all those kind of things that go into uh, talking uh, about it with children. I just realized I completely forgot to mention at the end of this, we will be doing a um, raffle of some books that were donated by Language Lizard. So if you'd like to be entered into that raffle, use the hashtag books in your comments. Um, now back to the actual topic. So as a parent, I didn't have these conversations growing up with my family and I know I know that they're important, but it can be scary and difficult to have conversations that you've never had modeled for you with your kids. So how can parents start um, having those kind of conversations? Yeah, and I think that's why I feel it's so important. Uh, like you and uh, many of us out there, you know, the, these conversations uh, didn't always happen in the home. And so sometimes we had to hear it. Um, I myself had to hear it like on the playground or, you know, in public spaces where, you know, maybe sometimes uh, uh, not so nice things were hurled at me, um, you know, about, about, you know, whatever they, whoever they thought they, they were looking at. Um, 
so I think that's why having these conversations early and often, um, I really encourage parents to kind of talk about that because we want to initiate and create an open and welcoming space for our children um, for questions and to, uh, you know, to give them an opportunity uh, to talk about it, to help create a language around these kind of topics. Um, I think what's hard uh, knowing now uh, some of the things that I've learned from my children and from myself, sometimes the kids don't even have the, the language around it. You know, they don't know that race is a social construct and, uh, you know, it's fluid and, and this whole, you know, uh, thing that we kind of know now maybe as adults. Uh, and so they may not even have the questions uh, to, to even open up a dialogue. So I think that's why it's important, even if you think your kids aren't interested or, oh, well, they haven't brought it up. It's important for us uh, to, to initiate those, those conversations and create a space for opportunities. And that could be done on several ways. Uh, what's important, I think, initially is to kind of confront your own biases and confront your own, um, you know, maybe educate yourself a little bit more, do some reading on your own. Uh, but I think what's really important is to really be honest with our children. Um, let them know that, you know, it's an opportunity to learn. If you don't have the questions or the answers to their questions, there's ways that together we could kind of come to uh, solve those kind of things and look up, um, you know, Google is a great resource. You know, we all kind of have that uh, at our, at our hand uh, and it's easy to kind of navigate. But I think when we're letting our kids know that we may not have all the answers, uh, it becomes this opportunity for each of us to learn. Um, but I think it's really important that we talk about it. We, uh, my, for myself, I'm constantly talking about it from uh, current events to, uh, you know, pop culture. If anything comes on uh, television or at the movies, you know, I always try to find opportunities to talk about um, culture and, uh, you know, ethnicity, uh, race, and any of those kind of things. I, if it's in the uh, supermarket, I think it, you know, I talked about it early on with my kids, kind of talking about, you know, um, it, it's not a bad thing to see race. Uh, talking about it is not racist. Uh, those kind of things uh, is really important for us to kind of talk talk through with our children the same way we do with, you know, uh, other difficult conversations around, um, you know, drugs and alcohol, those kind of topics, you know, uh, although they may be uncomfortable, they're necessary and they're important to, to discuss early and often. I love that point too, that it's not, I feel like sometimes people look at it as, oh, we have to have the talk about race and culture. And it's not a talk. It's you're constantly looking for opportunities to bring those up. And it can be as simple as, oh, hey, look, your skin is is darker than mine. What would you, how would you describe that color? Or look at, look right. at what happens when you go out in the sun and look at what happens when I go out in the sun. Things like that is all setting that foundation. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think what's what's um, the key to that, what you just said is, is, you know, normalizing these conversations and and finding them and really being uh, intentional with the conversations. Uh, I call it culture proofing. Um, and one of the things that I, I talk about during these kind of conversations uh, with parents is the same way that you child proof your home. Uh, which is to protect against uh, harm against your children. I culture proof my home, which is uh, protecting my children, um, you know, from harm to their identity. And so that means bringing in products uh, that, you know, look like the world around us, not just for what my household looks like, but really bringing um, products in from, uh, different cultures so that we can read about them, learn about them, um, as well as celebrating our own. Uh, I talked to you that my children are African American, Mexican, and Korean. So around my home, I have artwork um, 
we have music, we have books that look like them. Um, and, you know, I have little post-its around the house in different, in different languages, um, you know, identifying, you know, what a television is in Korean and in Spanish or the refrigerator, those kind of things. I think it's really important to normalize and to, for them to kind of see like, oh, you know, so that when they are faced with the challenge uh, on the playground, uh, they know how to kind of respond because it is most likely going to happen. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is really arm them in two different ways, arm them by building them up, by finding things that uh, are really great about their their ethnicities uh, and our, our multicultural heritage. Um, you know, looking at all the wonderful things in history that have happened uh, to our family and to, you know, um, also talk to them about the not so good things about our history, those kind of things, um, you know, we really are intentional about that in our home. And I think the intentionality is what's what is key for for these kind of conversations. That's a great point, too, because I, I know I tend to gravitate toward, oh, you need to know slavery happened. You need to know about immigrants. You need to know about the bad things. And I forget to talk about the good things and the beautiful things that come from being part of multiple cultures and multiple, multiple ethnicities and groups. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. You also mentioned that you have um, things in your home that represent other cultures that aren't represented in your family. Do you think that culture proofs them to not fear things that they perceive as different? Or how do you think that helps your, your kids? Yeah, for, for my kids, it just, um, you know, it, it decreases the amount of, um, you know, not being familiar with other cultures and really kind of, um, you know, at, I guess you, you talked about it, maybe about a fear of not knowing um, or, you know, if they hear something um, at school or in the, in the, you know, outside world, outside of our home then maybe they can challenge those kinds of uh, things. I really encourage um, the learning about others because it increases them, um, their compassion. It helps with empathy, um, their kindness towards others. Um, so I think learning about others is important to decrease, you know, some of the uh, ignorance or, um, fear that can happen uh, from not knowing. Um, so education and talking about this is really important. Um, and that's, you know, it's again, looking at, uh, you know, if, if your family's into watching movies together, it's, it's picking maybe a movie, um, you know, that kind of centers other cultures and kind of exploring that and, and learning about that. My kids always think that, oh my gosh, mom's always teaching. Uh, here we go again. And I think there's there's that aspect of it totally. Uh, but then there's other parts where it's about, you know, um, having fun. Maybe it's going to a museum or um, here in LA, there's different open um, uh, farmer's markets and you know in different are different uh, enclaves here in los angeles where you can learn you know maybe go to little tokyo or any of the other ethnic enclaves where it's it's about exploring it's about tasting new foods it's about um you know looking at the uh crafts that and the that the creators have made um it's really bringing those opportunities and looking for them with your children uh, so that you can learn, so that you, um, you know, when they are coming confronted with that, that it's not new to them. That's a great point. And you also mentioned in the beginning, you're learning together. You don't have to know everything about a culture, people group that you're exploring. You can learn together, which I think is something that holds a lot of parents back because they feel like, oh, I can't go to this festival. I can't go to this place because I don't understand enough. And kind of the point to learn. <laughs> yeah, I think we have to give ourselves grace and uh, really, um, you know, 
let ourselves not know. And, and, and it's so wonderful when you could let that guard down of, you know, learning with your children and um, talking through things and looking at, you know, going to credible uh, sites um, and, and kind of looking at both sides and, and really talking to those, those things about, you know, um, what is it, what, you know, learning and, and, you know, growing together. I think it's really important that they see the process um, because not only will that help them with just this, you know, topic, but it helps just help them navigate other topics. Um, you know, this is how we approach a situation. This is how we, uh, we navigate, you know, problems and it's problem solving and it's, um, you know, step one, step two, step three, those kind of things. We're teaching them all through this process. Um, so I think when we look at it like that, it, it helps ease the fact that we may not have, as parents, you know, have the answers and that's okay. You mentioned um, previously that comments on the playground or ignorant comments will happen, will probably be part of life. Do you specifically prepare your kids for those moments and like talk about them or how, what does that look like? Absolutely. I love that. Um, that you brought that up. I think, um, you know, the last few years of, you know, the time period that we're in, we've seen um, an increase of those conversations, right? And um, on, you know, just out in the public, out of the safety of your home. Um, and I know for my children, you know, they were, uh, they had insults hurled toward them and heard things that, you know, weren't very nice. And so the, again, going back to uh, finding age appropriate conversations to have with your children are important and uh, mimicking, you know, good behavior and, and an approach to these kind of situations is important. So uh, know that the mic is always hot when you're talking, um, and, and your kids are around, even though they may be in their electronics or in their books or whatever it is, uh, they're always kind of listening. So mimicking, you know, good behavior is important. Uh, but as they get older, um, my kids and I role play. And um, so that means, you know, having some of the things that you can imagine that's being said, um, you know, for, for as, as simple as, my children have different skin tones. They have different hair textures. Um, I've heard for myself firsthand some of the things that have been said to them. But uh, my children have always all also come back with some of the things that they uh, heard or have been said to them. So we, we role play this. Uh, we try to do it in advance so that they do feel like they're empowered uh, to, to react and... Um, and kind of challenge those kind of thinking. Um, I to talked about different skin tones and that doesn't always have to be with strangers. Sometimes uh, the messaging is coming from family members, whether it's well-intentioned or otherwise. Um, uh, you know, my, my son is darker than his siblings and um, some of the comments that come are, are towards his skin tone. And so we role play with kind of the dialogue that you can say to, you know, uh, you know, rebuke those kind of uh, conversations or, yeah, isn't that great? That's how, you know, genetics works or, um, yeah, my skin is, you know, my melanin is my superpower, you know, whatever the conversation is, but making sure that uh, we role play and come up with a few different, um, you know, pushbacks or, or, you know, yes, and it's beautiful. And yes, it's, you know, all those kind of things so that they feel empowered and they feel better and um, they're not surprised. And again, that comes from building uh, with intention the home that you're trying to create, which is one of, um, so that I'm understanding that the world that they're seeing, that their world that they're going out to. So what I try to do is build up and that, again, it goes to the point of 
uh, empowering them and looking at all the wonderful, you know, things in their culture, um, giving them the language, um, giving them um, access to books and all these things are all this part of building up so that when they do face that, uh, they're able to kind of, you know, push back and, and not take it all internally. We did not discuss this question ahead of time. So if you're not okay with it, let me know. But you, something you mentioned brought up a question that I've had in my head a lot too. The comments from families, from your family members hurt more than comments from strangers. As the mom, how do you handle those situations? Do you let your kids fend for themselves? Do you jump in? Do you, How do you handle family members um, who need to deal with their own thoughts and biases? <laughs> yeah, my, my job um, is to protect my children. And I think that's why uh, these conversations are so important when they are young. Um, so that, again, when, you know, somebody... Uh, family or otherwise says, says these kind of things, um, you know, it can hurt, it can sting. But if we're continu continuing to build them up, where I'm hoping that the sting is less uh, lessened because I brought in and instilled in them, you know, some of the pride. Um, but at those times when they are, you know, faced, um, it's, I feel my role is as protector as well as modeling um, how to respond and react. So if they are, you know, saying something um, that is off-putting, uh, I want my children to see that I'm going to be there to support them and to make sure that they are safe. And that's um, completely fair. I, I think that there's a way to handle it. I think there's a way to, um, you know, uh, turn the subject around. Uh, definitely want to acknowledge that that can be hurtful. So again, going back to uh, the skin tone, for instance, uh, you know, we talk about, isn't that great? Isn't that lovely? His skin, tone, you know, um, he's got, you know, a year round tan or whatever it is. So we try to turn that around. Or uh, if, you know, trying to challenge what the other person is really getting at, um, you know, you can ask them, you know, what is it about his skin tone that is upsetting you? And then kind of turn that around and get, you know, have them be uncomfortable versus my child be uncomfortable. Um, and so there, my kids are, again are watching, they're waiting for me. They're looking at me, um, to, to, to support them, to help them through this. Um, and then if need be, I will definitely pu uh, pull them aside, the uh, person who has not been very kind, um, and let them know that I am un it's unacceptable, um, you know, that they have some education uh, that they need to do, um, and what that does to my child um, when they hear things like that. Uh, and I think when, when you phrase it in a way that is, you know, I know you love my child, uh, but when you say things like that, it really hurts them. Um, and so I think when we, you know, phrase it in a way that allows them to see what words can do, uh, they start to think about it and they're not as uh, defensive in, in the response. That makes a lot of sense. And I like the fact that you put in there, I know you're not meaning to be hurtful. You love this child. Your intention is not to hurt them, but at the same time. Yeah, yeah and I think that should always be centered. Um, your child should always be the center of, you know, and their failing should always be centered when confronting, um, you know, friends and family that, you know, because they'll continue to say, oh, I was just joking or, oh, mm -hmm. you, you're so sensitive. Um, but really, you know, those kind of gaslighting um you, you know what you heard. And, and I think that's what happens um, with things like this. It's really knowing um, what you heard and, and, and the response that you're giving is valid. Right. Um, so. Right. Because even if the experience, their perception of it doesn't match yours, your perception is still valid. 
Yeah, and it really is, um, you know, impact, right, versus intention. Um, they could say that wasn't their intent, but the impact that was um, made with that comment is real. Um, so, so I think that's where you have to put the focus on the impact to your child, to you. Um, it really hurts me that you still think this way about, um, you know, my whatever it is, fill in the blank. Um, I need you, you know, if, if and and be willing to um, offer, you know, if you if you want, you know, suggestions or whatever it is, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but these kind of comments, uh, I don't think need to be ignored. It's important. It makes sense. In the in terms of um, cultural diversity, I feel like sometimes there's a misconception that you can read a book or you can. Um, watch a movie and suddenly you know when you understand culture. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about how to actually begin to understand a culture or gain a deeper understanding than just like the surface level? Yeah, although I love some really great books, there's, you oh, know, there's, 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 we should all have, you know, a, um, you know, some kind of primer on, on these kind of topics. We should all kind of, uh, you know, know how to talk to our children about, you know, culture and uh, nurturing identity. Uh, there's some really great folks out there uh, that have handbooks and uh, resources out there. Um, uh, there's folks on social media uh, that uh, talk to these points as well that we should follow uh, however you take in information. So that aside, I think, um, I, I know I've used this word a lot, uh, but again, the in, being intentional with uh, with this is really important. Um, so it is inserting yourself um, into these kind of uh, situations where um, you have access to different cultures and different um, ethnicities, whether that's through play groups, um, that's through the schools that you choose. Uh, that's through the friends that you have, that you make, um, that you, the relationships that you, you know, foster. It's about ingraining yourself into these, these other cultures, because that's what, for me, is really important. Um, it's, uh, it's understanding them. And I know TikTok and um, Instagram and other social media uh, allows us to kind of gleam into other cultures. And I think um, there's something to that as well as if you know, you know, how to discern between, um, you know, real and, and, you know, pretend or, or um, so I think there's an opportunity to learn about others more than, you know, we have in the past, but uh, it's really about finding opportunities to engage and interact with other cultures. Um, and, and again, with my kids, um, our schools are very diverse that we attend. Um, and so it's making sure that uh, you're involved in, in those kind of associations where you have opportunities to have, um, you know, maybe someone come in to talk about their culture. Maybe there is a multicultural day at your kid's school. Um, and maybe there is a play group where, you know, it, it has different, um, uh, you know, maybe it's a celebration of drums or, um, or it's a powwow or it's, you know, these other different activities that really can help you emerge yourself in learning. Um, so that, being intentional, I think, is very key, and finding these opportunities to bring your family um, to to explore and to learn. Um, check out the, your local. You know, we have Little Ethiopia, we have Chinatown, we have all the different ethnic enclaves around us here in Los Angeles. So I encourage folks to to take opportunity um, to find that in their area. Uh, try the foods, try the, um, uh, listen for music uh, that, you know, could happen, whether it's a little concert in the park. Uh, there's so many different ways to interact and exchange um, and uh, learnings with different cultures. 
This is a wonderful question. Um, do you believe that biracial and multiracial kids have their own culture or develop their own culture? <laughs> Oh my gosh, yes. Um, I love that so much. Um, being um, uh, someone who is biracial herself, African-American and Mexican, um, there is there is that culture itself. Um, so I think it is finding, um, uh, I'm part of the nonprofit organization. I serve as vice president of multiracial Americans of Southern California. Um, it wasn't until I found um, uh, in going to college, uh, back in, you know, um, the late nineties when I was really talking about those kind of issues where, uh, you know, I felt I wasn't black enough or Latina enough. Um, but then I found this group of, you know, those that identified as, uh, as more, you know, as, as multi that, uh, when, it didn't matter what the mix was. Uh, when I found them, it was like, oh my goodness, there here's another group that I can, you know, be a part of that understands, that gets it. Uh, so definitely, there is uh, that culture as well. Um, I'm also so I, and again, this is from the child, uh, from the person, I should say as well, um, because not everyone identifies the same. Um, Dr. Maria Root uh, has this great Bill of Rights for the multi-racial, um, uh, person of multi-racial heritage. Um, and I use that a lot with my children, uh, you know, to give them the right to acknowledge and, and share who they are um, and that that can change at any time. So I think it's important to understand that to know that um, it is really person-centered. Um, we don't have the right to, to kind of identify for them. Uh, but that being said, yes, there's definitely um, a culture there. I'm also um, being from a military family who was uh, born and uh, then went to a different culture like Hawaii or a different place like Hawaii. Uh, I'm considered a third culture kid. So that's also another community that I belong in. So there's definitely different communities within, um, uh, you know, being multicultural. I hope that helps. No, that, that links to it. Do, would, do, would you say that extends then to the entire family? So when you got married, did your culture then shift again to include your husband's cultures within well, yeah, so, so not for, uh, I mean, my being uh, married and having children that are Korean um, doesn't do that for me, but what it does is it helps me uh, help raise them in a way where, um, you know, they can tap into that part of them. Uh, so again, it's ma making sure that they, um, you know, my husband models what it is, um, you know, that he grew up with, uh, whether that's, you know, cooking foods or the language, um, to having conversations on WhatsApp with my mother-in-law, with my children in Korean or, you know, in broken English, that uh, whatever it is, or Korean English uh, uh, that they use together. So it's really just um, me watching them and learning from them um, about, you know, being Korean and being part of an Asian community. When, um, there was a increase in Asian, uh, hate, uh, in the, um, last couple of years, um, we made sure that, you know, they were supported and that, you know, we talked about these new issues and why some folks, um, you know, what, they could, again, goes back to what they could be hearing in the community or in social media. Um, so uh, I think for me, I didn't take that on as my own, um, but I am watching it and helping uh, bring that for my children. 
So it doesn't become a part of your identity, but it does become part of your responsibility to learn and grow with them. Right. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. We are reaching the half hour, 40 minute mark. So if anyone else in the audience has questions they would like to add, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I would love to know how how mixed up clothing came to be. What what made you decide to create that or what was that process? Yeah, uh, talk, you know, I, I talked about uh, going to college um, and kind of learning about, um, you know, there was Black Student Union and, and um, uh, Latin American groups. So I, when I was in college, I actually went to college to be a registered nurse. Um, so I graduated as a nurse. I took that um, and I uh, l melded that with my love of um, learning about different cultures. Uh, so I did like a multicultural and health kind of course. Uh, so I was kind of this diverse uh, diversity um, nurse in the hospital where I wanted to bring in culture to um, how that intersected with somebody's health, whether that was turning a bed towards Mecca, allowing for prayer rugs, uh, bringing in, you know, caldo from home um, that helped, you know, spiritually with healing, um, those kind of things. So I was always talking about culture. Fast forward, meet my husband. Um, and now all of a sudden, you know, I'm, uh, we talk about uh, the same way you have a business plan as a business owner, we had a family plan, uh, how we were going to raise our children, what we were, you know, early on, like this was that intentionality. And so one of the things that would happen in bringing in his culture and my culture was we celebrated um, Korean uh, when the kids are 100 days old uh, or they're told when they're one years old. Um, and so they had these beautiful Han box. And I saw like the amount of pride that my uh, husband had and his family had uh, from his culture. And then bring that in together with being Mexican, and we had like lo clorico wear, uh, you know, guayaberas, and and I was thinking, wouldn't it be great to have that same sense of pride, not just on holidays or you know festivals or uh, special occasions? What can I bring my children on a daily basis? And so because I'm here in Los Angeles, I had access to different fabrics. I'd been sewing since seventh grade. Um, so I found fabrics that uh, spoke to me that had, you know, um, iconic kind of uh, motifs from our culture. And I turned them into everyday kind of clothes, dresses, uh, tops, bottoms, shorts, would you name it. Um, and people would stop me on the street and ask about the 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 fabric. And then they'd also share, oh my goodness, my culture has this, or, you know, um, matrushkas or nesting dolls or whatever it was. And I thought, oh my goodness, these clothes are my vehicle to talk about culture and diversity and inclusion. And so I left nursing. I started mixed up clothing and, um, Today, we are in Macy's and Belk and online and all these other wonderful places because folks are now pushing back on what it is uh, to bring in their culture into every day. Um, no longer are we kind of rolling into this melting pot where everyone goes in, we melt down and we come out, quote unquote you know, American or, or whatever it is. Now we're saying, no, we can hang on to our culture, cultures, um, and still be, you know, American or this. Uh, so this hyphenated world that we're now kind of moving into is really the beauty and uh, the celebration of ourselves and not kind of, hold, you know, you know, pushing that down and separating it. So um, I brought that into the, the clothing, into the, the fashion, 
into mainstream retailers um, because there's a market. Folks want to see themselves. Folks want to, uh, you know, celebrate that. And they want to see aspects of their culture um, across all industries. And fashion is no different. That is amazing. That's an amazing story. Well, thank you very, very much for being here and for sharing all of this information with everyone listening. Um, I will make sure all of the links that you mentioned and resources you mentioned are in the description so people can find them easily. Um, where's the best place to follow you if they want to know more about you? Yeah, I am at Mixed Up Clothing. Uh, my social media handles, um, all those uh uh, things are through mixed up clothing. Um, they can also find me through multiracial Americans of Southern California. Um, and they, uh, I, um, and that is at multiracial Americans us on social media. Perfect. I will add those in there so they can find that as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having these important conversations. Thank you. Thank you.